On this episode of This Week in Space, we talk to Dr. Pascal Lee, planetary scientist and Arctic adventurer, about living on the moon and Mars. Also, busy times at the Cape, Ingenuity spots bits of its landing tech, and a flyby of a really big asteroid this week. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number nine, recorded on April 29th, 2022. Living on the Moon and Mars. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30 at checkout. And by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. Get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space. I'm Rod Pyle and today my co-host Tarek Malik. How are you, Tarek? Hello. I'm doing well. Thanks. Hi, all. The two of us will be joined by our special guest, Dr. Pascal Lee. Hello, Pascal. Hi, Tariq. Hi, Rod. How are you? Very good. Thanks for coming today. This is going to be exciting. I'm really glad you could make it. But um, before we go there, it'll come to a shock to many people that I have an effervescent joke, which I tell every week for my esteemed colleague, uh, Tariq, here. So sadly, today is no exception. Hey, Tariq. Uh, Yes, Rod. What does a Martian say when it needs more Earthlings for lunch? Uh, I don't know, Rod. What does a Martian say? Bring me some extraterrestrials. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Okay. Every week I love it. <laughs> so today we're here to talk about how humans may one day live on Mars and the moon. And Dr. Lee has spent a lot of time thinking about this and actually uh, – participating in exercises to kind of uh, research and build out this future. But before we go there, we have a couple of headlines. And today, all three come from our good friends at space.com. Busy times at the Cape. SpaceX is coming and going, and Boeing is finally making plans to relaunch Starliner. Tarek, what's going on at the Cape? Well, it's been a, a really kind of rapid fire week right now. Uh, SpaceX started started off with uh, the return of their private mission AX One. That's four private astronauts uh, who uh, some of them paid fifty five million dollars a pop to go to the International Space Station. They were going for ten days. They got two weeks because of weather delays to come back to Earth. So that's I don't know if they actually get four extra free days in space, but you know I think that they were pretty excited to to have a longer stay. Um, and uh, uh, that mission was kind of the 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 roadblock to yet another mission. SpaceX then turned around in a couple of days and launched four new astronauts for NASA and the European Space Agency, the Crew-4 a- a mission uh, to the, the station. They made the fastest SpaceX trip to the station uh, ever, about 16 hours, just about under, about 15 and a half, actually. Uh, and they're beginning a whole six-month mission. Meanwhile, uh, actually, as we're speaking, SpaceX is counting down to launch a Starlink uh, mission from uh, its other uh, pad in in Florida at, at uh, uh, Cape Canaveral uh, Space Force Station. So, um, uh, so it's just been a a pretty uh, whirlwind uh, trip for them. And there was a photo too uh, last week, actually, while this was all going on, uh, of SpaceX launching another Starlink mission while the AX one uh, or the the Crew Four rocket was on the pad and the Space Launch System was on the pad. It looks really sci-fi there with all these different rockets standing there. So pretty busy time, uh, to say the least. So there's probably something to be said in here about SpaceX launching however many times while SLS is rolling back to the barn and Starliner is holding off till May. But I'm not going to go there. Yeah. Um, no. We, oh, I should I should point out Starliner that the date that Boeing is now kind of targeting is May 19th. Uh, We're getting very, very close to one year now since their last attempt to launch this mission, uh, where they actually had to change out a a service module uh, for that Starliner because of a stuck valve that they really couldn't couldn't figure out. Uh, So this is their second test flight for NASA. It's an uncrewed mission of their space taxi, uh, very similar to what uh, SpaceX does with Crew Four already. They've they're they're on their I think their their fourth operational flight, fifth flight for NASA this with their launch this week. Um, And if this goes well. 
it's a five day trip to the station. Uh, SpaceX, uh, NASA and Boeing hope to start uh, flying astronauts maybe by the end of the year, maybe a little later, early next year. All right. Uh, next up, Ingenuity spots part of Papa during its 26th flight. It's made 27 now. The Ingenuity Mars helicopter took some pictures of the aeroshell and parachutes from the horse it rode in on, otherwise known as the Perseverance rover. And that assignment was part of planning work for the sample return mission being planned by NASA and the European Space Agency for some of the Martian samples being picked up by Perseverance. So besides the fact that this is a killer photograph, um, <laughs> what else is unique about this, Tariq? Well, one of the one of the interesting things that um, that Ingenuity has done is it's captured some of the hardware that got Perseverance on Mars. So what what, what it saw was the the back shell uh, of the rover's landing system, and that's kind of the protective part. the The parachutes were were attached to that on, on the on the to slow it to slow it on the on the way down. And the hope is that by seeing this stuff and what happened to it after. Uh, after it separated, you know, knowing how it performed uh, after the fact can help them plan for the next big mission to Mars, this Mars sample uh, return mission, when they're going to have to land uh, not just a, a little rover and a landing system, but an actual rocket to launch bits into space. And they want to keep that safe on the way back down. Um, I would say that as someone that likes to see interesting things of Mars, uh, seeing actual hardware uh, from uh, from the, the, the vehicle itself, uh, which you don't see all that often, you know, normally it hits the ground and all you see are photos that it's taken, uh, is, right. is really just a special treat. And it's kind of an added thing because this ingenuity helicopter was only supposed to make a couple of, a couple flights in a month and be done with it. We're now past right. a year and it's still turning out new things. So 27 flights instead of the estimated five. five and one yeah. of the things that I think was remarkable I mean, we've seen the detritus of, um, of, of the bits that come off a lander before from orbit, but we've never seen them like this. And one of the things that was really interesting also, I think for the JPL folks, was the parachute's there, and it's mostly intact. And one of the things that are, is really difficult on Mars landings is when they deploy the parachute, it's coming out at supersonic speeds, and they just love to tear. And as uh, one engineer put it to me, uh, parachutes in the Martian atmosphere are like wild animals, really, no matter how you model them, no matter how you test them on Earth and try and uh, model them in computers, it's, it's fabric, you know, and it's just impossible. So it's really just something where they kind of, to, to an extent, they have to cut across their fingers and hope. So they were very gratified to see that this looked to be like it was pretty much one piece. Yeah, and to your point, to your point, Rod, parachute problems mm -hmm. are what's kept Europe's Mars rover, ExoMars, uh, on the ground because uh, they want to make sure that it's safe. Now they can have an after image and and know exactly, we built this parachute for Perseverance to do this, here's what it looks like after the fact, and then use that as a baseline for the next big thing. Until we can put them on Elon starships and land them in there, I think this is all a very good idea. Our last story is a near miss for Earth. Yesterday, asteroid 2008 AG33, that's a lyrical name, flew past Earth, missed our planet by about 2 million miles, which seems like a lot. Um, it's multiples of the distance between the Earth and the Moon, but it's still just one more wake-up call. Um, this is a very large asteroid, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,150 to 2,560 feet across. And remember, the Chelyabinsk meteorite, which came in, was 60 feet wide, and that was the size of a small nuclear explosion in terms of energy output. So when you're talking about an asteroid this size, depending on whose estimates you, you look up, you'd get a crater somewhere between 4 and 10 miles wide, which is at least twice the, the, the width of Manhattan. Some estimates go as high as 14 miles. An ignition radius of between 60 and 100 miles. Some moderate environmental effects. This isn't a, a civilization-ending asteroid at least as far as we, we think, but you would have some, some crop failures and a number of other interferences. And if you're one of the people in that great big multi-mile crater that it lands on, you probably don't care about the long-term effects. You're pretty upset that it came down on your head. So it's just a reminder once more that planetary, defending, uh, planetary defense funding is critical. Um, and this is something we really need to be talking about. Now, we do have the DART mission, 
which will be arriving at the near-Earth object Didymus in September, October of this year for a deflection test. It's an impactor. But uh, there's a lot more money being asked for by NASA for uh, both orbital and Earth-bound detection of these things because spotting them is a big part of the challenge because they're really dark and they're That's out right. in the dark. So they're very hard to hard to uh, to spot. Uh, any updates on, on DART, Tark? Well, uh, we, we, we know that the, uh, they're, they're getting ready. In fact, I was, I'm sorry, I was thinking about Psyche just recently because Psyche passed the Psyche mission uh, to that asteroid is just passed a bunch of, of great big tests. But, you know, um, DART, uh, DART is, uh, uh, you know, gearing up. It's going to be a really good mission to, uh, to not just smack an asteroid, but see what happens afterward. Uh, you know, we've, right. we've hit comets before. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the last we heard, everything's going well. Uh, with that, with that flight, we'll just keep keep uh, uh, keep tracking it. Now we've got a uh, a few other missions too. Uh, the Europe, uh, the European Space Agency has Hera as well. Ch uh, China just announced that they they want to do their own planetary defense uh, mission too, and um, uh, and so uh, so there is definitely a, kind of an uptick in that. Meanwhile, um, uh, we've got uh, hopefully some samples coming back from another asteroid from NASA's Osiris Rex mission uh, later uh, uh, later this year, or uh, later in, in the next few years, actually. So, okay, well, we'll be catching up on that in future episodes. I should point so, out though that this asteroid isn't gone; you know, uh, it does have an orbit. It, the the one that just flew by a short one, uh, yeah, yeah. So it it swings by er by us by Earth every seven years or so. So it you know mark your mark your calendars for Memorial Day weekend in twenty twenty nine, May twenty fifth. It's gonna come back. And hope it doesn't bump into something on the way and change course, because that would be a bad afternoon for somebody. That's right. All right. We'll be back in a moment to discuss living on the moon and Mars with Dr. Pascal Lee, who's been very patient. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. The world of IT is colossal and always changing. So where do you start to get the updated certs and training you need? Whether you're a seasoned IT professional or just getting started, IT Pro TV is the online learning IT education platform you need to advance your skills in IT. IT Pro TV has seven studios filming Monday through Friday. They also have the most up-to-date content with every vendor and skill you need to advance your IT career. Their courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute episodes for easy binging. They make sure you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. The best part about IT Pro TV is that you can learn and get certified on your own schedule and it's entertaining. April is Linux month at IT Pro TV. Check out the on demand webinar with Don Pizzette and Daniel Lowry focused on choosing the right Linux distro in 2022. IT Pro TV has over 138 hours of Linux training available. Here's a couple of courses you may want to check out. Linux Shell Scripting, Basics, LPIC2 Linux Engineer, or Linux Command Line, plus so many more. And don't forget about your IT team. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code TWIT30 for an additional 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. So for the past two weeks, Tarek and I have been discussing getting humans to Mars. We've certainly talked a lot on the show about NASA sending astronauts back to the moon to stay. So today we'd like to talk a little bit with Dr. Lee about how we might actually live on these other worlds, such as the moon and Mars, for the long term. Now, first, I've got to give you a little bit of an introduction, Pascal, and I'll try not to gush too much. We've known each other a long time. And actually, I, I think I first became aware of you in the 80s from the NSS's magazine, if it was Ad Astra at that time or something else. And I thought, wow, this guy looks like he has a really interesting life. I want to be him when I grow up. Sadly, that <laughs> hasn't happened. But... Uh, um, you, you're a planetary scientist. You're the founder and director of the Mars Institute, which is certainly unique among the type of institutions that it is. You're also the founder of the Houghton Mars Project, which is not growth of the Mars Institute, and we're going to talk about today. You're a painter. You're a book author. And for all I know, you are a great French philosopher and brain surgeon, sort of like the buckaroo bonsai of our time. How are you? Good. Uh, good to see you, both of you. So you have a, a fairly extensive and 
fascinating backstory, which we can't do justice here today, but um, I, I would just like to, to get a few comments from you. How did you first get interested in space in general and Mars in particular? Because you really, your career has been kind of Mars driven. Uh, as a kid, uh, I was always, I grew up steeped in uh, science fiction. In fact, I was spending too much time on television watching uh, space shows like Lost in Space, Star Trek, the first season. Uh, and so my parents decided to put me in boarding school, and that's when my academic uh, life got straightened up. But um, that's how I was, I got interested in space through science fiction, I think. Uh, and then uh, I think for a long while, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to, you know, just tinker with rockets or, or become a scientist. And it's after reading Carl Sagan's uh, early book called The Cosmic Connection. This is a book he wrote uh, when he was already famous, but not as famous as when he when he did Cosmos. It's an earlier book. The Cosmic Connection made me decide that I, I did not, could not be a rocket scientist. I wanted to be a, a planetary scientist. Well, you actually ended up working with Sagan, didn't you? Well, uh yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I I was born in the most un-Mars-like place on Earth, which is Hong Kong. Uh, and then I went to boarding school in France. And that's when I became aware of Carl Sagan. But that was, you know, such a far dream still to, to one day meet him. But eventually I applied for graduate school in the United States and uh, became a grad student at Cornell. And I ended up, uh, of course, meeting Carl, but also became becoming his last TA, which of course was a, was a lot of fun. I was, I was going to uh, ask Pascal, uh, I was going to ask Pascal, um, uh, how do you become a planetary scientist, by the way, you know, do you have to pick a, a, a favorite planet first or, or, or are there other prerequisites that you, that you were going to set up, set up? Uh, I was, I was interested in, in all planets and space travel, uh, along, alongside that, uh, I remember reading uh, another book that really made me in some sense, which is a, a book that was written in French by Albert Ducot. He's sort of the, the, the French space guru he was at the time when he was still alive. And uh, it was called In Search for Life on Mars, A la Recherche d'une Vie sur Mars. And that was such a fascinating book to me because it was a description of the Viking missions and their early results. Uh, so, so I did start with... With Mars, actually, I, I was really in love with Mars from the get-go. Uh, and then, in terms of becoming a planetary scientist, it's just a, a lot of homework, <laughs> a lot of homework. But the sense that you know, uh, with focus, 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 and perseverance, 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 uh, it, it it ends up paying off. Uh, I often talk to kids about you know how to become a scientist, and uh, it's not supposed to be pleasant along the way. Uh, but once you are a scientist, it's a good life. It's a very exciting life. Not supposed to be pleasant along the way. I think there's a sweatshirt in that, probably. <laughs> um, we talked in the past about this also. So for your French National Service, instead of uh, doing a round in the military, you went off to the Antarctic for, was it 401 days? Yeah, 402. Uh, 402 days. Yeah, at awful. the time there was a, at the time I was finishing college in Paris, I, there, was a, there was still a draft in France. And most of my friends would be drafted and just accept their fate, which was to go to Germany and spend a year running around with a machine gun. I, I actually was eyeing this particular spot that they had for one scientist, one geologist uh, in it at the Antarctic French, the French Antarctic station, uh, Du Mondioville. I was eyeing that one position for, for, for a few years. And three years ahead of time to maximize my chances of possibly getting picked for that slot, I, I turn in my application by saying that, hey, I was three years ahead of schedule, but uh, I, will, I will be a geologist by then and I would like to get that job. Geologists and geophysicists is what they were looking for. Anyway, sure enough, I, I got in. So that completely changed my life because I, I went to, like you said, I, I went to spend over a year in Antarctica. I went it over at the, the French base. Uh, and uh, it, it was a life-changing experience because, of course, I was seeking that experience as a as an opportunity to live on, on some other world, essentially. Uh, and it, it definitely delivered in terms of that kind of experience. But 
it was it was it was so enriching scientifically as well to just to see the earth nature uh, you know the southern lights uh, you you are in a place like antarctica you are in in brunt uh, in blunt contact with uh, with nature uh, and and the cosmos really i mean you see the southern sky the center of the galaxy is is dominating the night sky and of course the skies are so cold and therefore still and clear that you know you're you're overwhelmed really by by the by the stars at night. It's it's incredible. There's a whole universe out there that we don't see anymore from our cities. Oh, absolutely. And even from driving away from our cities these days, it takes an awful yeah. long while to be able to see anything. So um I'm gonna have to jump forward a decade or two here. You spent time in the in the Antarctic, and as you mentioned, you know, part of this was this idea of what's it like to live in another world, on another world. And uh, then about the time I think you and I first got acquainted, it was probably a few years before that, um, you had opened up a base in the Arctic. So tell, yes. tell us how that happened and why. Yeah, so after Antarctica, I... I went to grad school. Uh, in fact, I applied to one grad school uh, naively. Uh, just as I was sailing down to Antarctica, I posted my application in Singapore to go to Cornell. And sometime in the middle of the winter, I got this notification that I was expected in Ithaca, New York. Uh, I had to look up a map uh, to attend grad school when I came back. But uh, while I was in grad school, I was, of course, longing to go back to the polar regions. I thought that there was really something about them to teach us uh, about Mars and not just the science of Mars, but how to live on Mars and how, how to be really efficient at exploring an extreme environment like, like Mars is. Uh, and, uh, and so even while I was in graduate school, I had my eyes towards returning to the polar regions. And then I was looking at this map of impact craters on earth. There was, there's about 200 at the time there were about 200 known impact craters on our planet. Uh, we're still at about that number. It's about two, 250 now. Uh, but, um, there was that one crater that was, uh, the highest latitude impact crater on earth on land. It was on this very remote Island called Devon Island, which, uh, I found out was the largest uninhabited Island on earth. Uh, it's about the size of West Virginia with even fewer people on it than West Virginia. Uh, and in fact, there's nobody on Devon Island. Uh, and uh, I thought, wow, this is a place where you have an environment that climatically is cold and dry, which is rare on Earth, actually. It's not that common. But in other words, you have a real polar desert. Alaska, all of Siberia, that's not polar desert. That's tundra. Uh, it's cold but wet. Here you are in the high eastern Arctic of the Earth, uh, eastern North American Arctic of the Earth, uh, and you are in a cold polar desert. And so, so it had all the basic ingredients of a good Mars analog: impact crater, large piece of real estate that's unoccupied, untouched. Meanwhile, it's sitting under a climate that's cold and dry, and has been for most of the life of that crater. Uh, I had to go. This was possibly Mars on Earth, and I. I think it is. What does it take to get there, uh, Pascal? I mean, so, you know, I'm, I'm here in my New Jersey suburb and, uh -huh. and I took a trip to Virginia. I was at uh, eight hours in a, in a compact car, but yeah. it sounds like getting to Devon Island, it's a, a, a bit more of a trek than that. Yeah. What does it take to get there? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> uh, it takes uh, perseverance actually. Uh, these days we have to first fly into Canada uh, I travel with my dog who serves as our polar bear guard dog. So I fly from uh, San Jose, California to Vancouver first, where I then hook up with other colleagues who are joining us uh, who, who live in the uh, Washington state area. Then we fly to Ottawa uh, from there. Ottawa, because it's the sole departure point really to head up to the Eastern high Arctic uh, these days. Uh, and so you overnight in Ottawa and then you you fly the next morning to Resolute Bay in the Arctic with one plane change halfway up uh, to the Arctic. 
uh, in Iqaluit, which used to be known as Frobisher Bay. But once you're in Resolute Bay, you are in the high Arctic. You are on a separate island from Devon Island. It's, the, it's on the island that's immediately west of Devon Island. It's called Cornwallis Island. And Resolute Bay has a community of 250 Inuit plus uh, people from down south who, who run um, uh, some of the logistics up there uh, for the Canadian government. Uh, and then you're, you're patient again. You have to overnight in Resolute. And then the next morning, if the weather is okay, you get to Devon Island. You fly on to, Dev- to Devon Island on a small twin otter plane. It's sort of a Dash 8 uh, ca- cargo version of a Dash 8 on Tundra tires. Uh, you, you fly into a place where you don't know if the weather will allow you to land or not. So it's always a hit and miss. Uh, but... Uh, uh, we have a little dirt strip that's about 200 meters long, so it's, there's not a lot of room for error either. Uh, but once you're on Devon, you are you are on another planet, and it's it's very rewarding. But it, it is a three day trip, wow. so much like going back to the moon or going. Except, to the moon. I guess you you wouldn't need a a polar bear guard dog when you go to the moon or Mars, right? You don't need a polar bear <laughs> so. guard dog. Yeah, I mean. My my dog has never ran, ran into a polar bear yet, but he is he is sniffing around quite a bit, and we've seen him being alerted to some some smells before. So I'm pretty sure that he is smelling uh, intruders. And the polar bear is at the top of the food chain in the Arctic. Make no mistake. So even though we have shotguns with us, just in case we have an encounter, you know, they uh, I, I'm much happier with my dog as a warning system and the dog of course is not expected to attack the polar bear it's 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 expected to distract it uh and a dog can run faster than a polar bear but a polar bear is very fast as well uh so so it's 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 the idea is a it's a deterrent it's a it's a decoy if you will it's like those things that you shoot out of air force one or marine one it's to intercept the polar bear so that it doesn't hit you immediately we have lots so of polar you, bear jokes in the Arctic. Uh, you know, like <laughs> you don't have to really outrun the polar bear. You just have to outrun somebody else. Uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Oh, you got a rim shot. So you've spent uh, this year will be your 22nd season up there. Is that right? Well, uh, we had a this coming year will be our 25th field season, actually. And mm. we we've been trying to hit that mark for quite a while. But at uh in 2019, we had our 24th field season, and after that, we had COVID. And so for the past right. two summers, we haven't been able to go back to Devon Island, which has been very frustrating. We had otherwise an uninterrupted streak of of my spending every summer of my life on Devon Island. I moved to California 25 years ago. Uh, until COVID, I had yet to spend a summer uh, in California. I had no idea what surfing was or... <laughs> <laughs> I was on another shore, but yeah, but uh, but well, not for the Pacific. For all the time you spent up there, I mean, I, I know you're very busy, but uh, you also uh, you do a lot of research work up there in coordination with NASA and others. So let's talk a little bit about your specialty as Mars, but also living on the Moon because the conditions are not as different as a lot of people might think. I mean, they're both. Both the moon and Mars are radiation saturated. Uh, the moon exists in a vacuum. Mars has an atmosphere, but it's not not very noteworthy, in it, except for the fact that you can you know draw oxygen from it and so forth. But in terms of atmospheric protection, it doesn't offer much. So, given that these environments are harsh and really wild temperature extremes and so forth, what what sort of conclusions have you come to in terms of the best way? to build longer term habitats in these places. Yeah, you make a good point. I, I think it, it's worth emphasizing how sometimes there's a perception that, okay, the moon is pretty hostile, but Mars somehow will be a lot more pleasant. Uh, and the truth is Mars is 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 as lethal as the moon is, uh, if not more, and at the same time farther away. So it's a really big challenge. I, I often describe the five things that will kill you on Mars in chronological order of cause of death. Uh, the first one, of course, if you are unprotected, is the low atmospheric pressure. And although you just mentioned there, there is an atmosphere there, indeed, it's very thin. And so within seconds, you are dead if you have a depressurization incident uh, on Mars. 
if that doesn't kill you, the carbon dioxide that the atmosphere is made of is, is a toxic gas. And so you would die of hypoxia within a minute or two uh, if you did not have oxygen fed to you. Uh, if that didn't kill you, then you are dying of, t- of the cold. The temperature on Mars is on average minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus 63 Celsius. Uh, with By the time the sun is down, you are frozen to the bones if you are not uh, you know, protected by a suit. Uh, and then if that doesn't kill you, the dust on Mars is uh, lethal. And again, there's no exaggeration there. It is replete with perchlorates and peroxides. They're both very nasty for you to ingest. The dust is very fine grained. Uh, so the three aspects of the dust that will kill you is the fact that it's chemically toxic, uh, very fine grained, and so it will clog the pores of your lungs. That's silicosis. That's what is often known as miner's disease. And the dust is very abrasive, even though there's a bit of rolling around of the dust grains in the Martian atmosphere, uh, it's still going to be very much like the lunar regolith. It's very shard-like. Uh, so uh, this notion, for example, of growing potatoes by scooping in tons of Martian dirt into your habitat is completely uh, wrong because, <laughs> first of all, you would be breathing in all this dirt and you would be dead from the peroxides and the perchlorates within two weeks. It's going to attack your thyroid. And uh, But second, uh, the potatoes will be poisoned with the perchlorates. Uh, and so you're going to die of food poisoning, essentially. Uh, so Mark, that doesn't Mark, work. Mark, you mean Mark Watney from The Martian lied to us? Is that what you're saying, Pascal? <laughs> Mark Watney would not have made it the way he did. Yes. Uh, that's that's oh, wow. basically, that's very clear. And uh the other thing, of course, is that <clears throat> had he been a really good botanist, he should have known that you don't need dirt to grow food. He can just do hydroponics. So with just a poop and water, he was, he should have been able to grow food uh, <laughs> if he had a very large supply of poop, which he did apparently. <laughs> so uh, he did not need to bring in the Martian dirt. That, that should have been left outside uh, the, the habitat. Well, and this uh, doesn't even this doesn't even begin to touch on the fact that he had a massive hole in the side of the cargo carrier that he uses habitat, which he taped a sheet of plastic over in a near vacuum environment. I didn't understand that. Did you? <laughs> well, I, I, I can don't you remember breathe that in a specific... one half psi environment. No, you cannot breathe in a one half psi environment, but. Uh, I should say that you know Andy. I know Andy Ware pretty well. We yeah. we are neighbors uh, in in the Bay Area, and he uh, I, I often tease him about you know this or that that <laughs> doesn't quite work. But he's he's a really smart guy, and I don't want to take anything away from how exciting no, his, he, his novel is. No, he did is. research the hell out of it. But you got to yeah. write a story, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, the dirt is not benign. The dirt is really nasty, and you want to really. Be isolated from. In fact, the the art of surviving on Mars would be the art of managing the dust, assuming the rest of the life support systems stuff is, is sort of covered. Uh, you really have to manage the dust and not come in contact with it as much as possible. And then That's finally, true on the moon as well, correct? Which is true on the moon as well. But the moon's dust, at least, is not toxic, chemically right. toxic, as far as we know. It's just abrasive and very fine grained. So, so there, it's a, it's a mechanical problem, uh, strictly. Mm. Uh, where it's a physical chem- problem strictly, whereas on Mars it's a physical chemical problem. Now, the good news about the peroxides, for example, is that they can be washed out of the regolith relatively easily. So if you if you run water through your Martian soil, uh, you can wash out the peroxides and the perchlorates relatively easily, and then you have a substrate that is more benign for, for plant growth and things like that. But then you might wash away some of the nutrients, so... So we'll have to look into that. Uh, finally, the radiation hazard will kill you on Mars now on timescales of months to years. And there's, there's a fixation about radiation when it comes to going to Mars when, in fact, it's the thing that will kill you the slowest, and uh, if at all. So I, I think it's mainly because there's very little you can do uh, – that against radiation that makes it so prominent in our worries about going to Mars. But, you know, if you're worried about dying on a trip to Mars, you shouldn't even be on a rocket. Uh, you're, you're putting your life at risk. Uh, I think rockets, generally speaking, are less reliable than we think they are. Uh, launches in general, I think. But anyway, you, you, are, you are at risk, a uh, huge risk of death. Uh, and, and it just starts. 
from that point on, you you are facing death every day as an astronaut in deep space. And so this business of worrying about radiation, because it's going to increase uh, in a bad year, it's going to increase your chances of having a fatal cancer by about 5 to 10% uh, you know, for the rest of your life is is in my view sort of a something that we need to to relativize compared to all the other dangers we face in in a, in a trip to Mars. Well, one more argument for sending old guys like us out there because we have that many fewer years to get cancer and and, and die, right? And yeah, if a rocket people, does splat into Mars, it's less of a loss. Older people have have uh, you know care less about their gonadic uh, information. But the other thing too is that when you're older, your cells divide more slowly. This is why cancers are so aggressive in young people. Uh, once you hit your mid fifties, your, 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 your mid sixties, uh, you, you are much less uh, prone to cancer. I mean, cancer in very old people is almost indistinguishable from, from just, you know, normal slipping away uh, because the cancers are so sluggish. Uh, right. Generally speaking, so so yeah. In fact, this is this is another misconception in most science fiction movies. In fact, if, if not all of them, is is you always have this very dashing young crew going to Mars. When in fact, uh, because it's going to be a small crew, you have to have a lot of expertise built into that crew. And to build an expertise and experience, you you just need time to build that. Therefore, crew members are likely to be, uh, you know, for the youngest, probably in their mid to late forties. Uh, if you're doing it right, uh, and you you want a crew that's super experienced in a lot of things, uh, and have people who are seasoned astronauts going to Mars, you know, people who are in their, and I don't mean necessarily professional astronauts, I just mean people who are very seasoned in their experience that's going to be needed for a mission to Mars, like geology or biology or medicine. You want seasoned people going, uh, being part of your crew, uh, and so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the average age of a good crew for Mars were, were in the mid-60s. Well, it's good to finally be, to have arrived at the right age for something besides Social Security, <laughs> so I appreciate that. We're going uh, to be back in a minute to continue our, our off-world adventure after this message from the good folks at Blue Land. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion with a B plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away every year? And as if that's not bad enough, each of these bottles can contain more than 90% water. So you're just shipping around heavy water. That's a lose-lose situation for our planet. You know, plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, almost 60% of whales, 36% of seals, and 40% of seabird species examined. By 2050, get this, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. That's serious business. We need to start creating a cleaner planet from home. Blue Land's idea is simple, and it's beautiful. You buy the bottle once, you refill it forever. No more plastic waste. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive or less effective. You just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagrammable bottles with warm water, pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within minutes, you have powerful cleaning products in incredible scents like iris agave, perrine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo and plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land is something for every inch of your home. And backed by popular demand is Blue Land's toilet tablet cleaner. Get it before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just 2 bucks. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it, and your planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash space. blueland.com slash space. So let's talk a little bit about these habitats because if if you're part of the space enthusiast group, which which Tarek and I certainly are, because we're journalists, um, you hear a lot about oh we're going to build these things in caves because that puts lots of rock and, and regolith over our heads and that'll protect our habitats from radiation. And you've done some work on this, and there's the situation on Mars 
but it doesn't quite match up with the situation on the moon. And the current conversation, of course, because we're headed back to the moon, we hope in a few years, uh, with astronauts, seems to revolve a lot around lunar habitats. So what's the story with uh, lunar lava tubes and why might they or might not they be a good idea? Yeah, okay, so now we're, we're shifting gears, I guess, away from, from Devon. Uh, I'm interested in caves on the moon and Mars, mainly because, in my view, the caves on Mars are the holy grail for the search for life on Mars. And let me just summarize this quickly. Um, even today, if perseverance or curiosity drove by a rocky outcrop and there were, there were the fossil bones of a giant beast sticking out of the road cut, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's alien life or not, okay? Uh, I mean, it could look weird. You would write a good paper in Nature, but, and if Nature doesn't want it, science will pick it up. But the point is, you, you're you not sure you've discovered alien life because you don't have the means to really identify, uh, you know, with certainty that you're dealing with an alien form of life. And this is because Earth and Mars are not isolated systems. We have meteorites that have come naturally from Mars because asteroids or comets, large ones, have hit Mars and kicked off Martian rocks, transferred them to the Earth. The reverse has certainly happened as well. Large impacts on Earth must have lobbed Earth rocks into space, onto the moon. We know already that. But also, uh, uh, very probably, onto Mars as well. And so microbial life from Earth could have seeded Mars very early in Mars's history, Life could have evolved on Mars, you know, along its own path. And if the fact that we would run into some fossil of a life form on Mars would be exciting, but it could just be descendants of our ancient ancestral microbial cousins. Uh, it wouldn't tell you that you found an alien form of life on Mars per se, which is really the reason why we're so fixated on the search for life. We, we want to know if we're alone. We want to know if life started on its own on another planet. We have to not just find life on another world, but a certain that it is alien. To do that, you have to do genetics. All life on Earth, all life of the Earth, past and present, shares genetic material in common. We're all part of the same genetic tree of life. Uh, and what we're looking for really is something that would be genetically alien to that tree, uh, precisely another tree of life, something that sprung out on its own, independent of the Earth's tree of life. Uh, and so... To do that, you have to find it alive. You cannot do genetics on something that's dead, or at least not dead for a very long time. To find it alive, uh, you have to go underground today on Mars. I think we, we've now established that the surface of Mars is not optimal for, for life, as we know it at least, but that needs to metabolize the way normal life does here on Earth. Uh, we need to go underground. Underground, the environment is entirely different. And on Earth, you know, caves are in the category of cool things to behold. But on Mars and the moon, caves are incredible opportunities because they now offer something that is radically different from what's happening at the surface. I mean, on the Earth, caves are very different from what's happening at the surface as well. But, you know, you, life is not at the edge there on Earth to need caves to persist. On the moon or Mars, all of a sudden in caves, you have conditions that are within the realm of what life on Earth could enjoy. Uh, and this is why I think exploring caves on Mars, other than deep drilling on Mars, which is, of course, the other way of getting into the ground, um, but that's very hard. Uh, caves on Mars, which we know exist by the thousands, uh, are, are, in my view, the number one target we should focus on from here on, both robotic missions and then eventually humans. Uh, yeah, if the gonna, search for life on Mars is our big, big focus. Yeah, so that brings us add, back oh, to, yeah, sorry. Sorry, go sorry. ahead, Terry. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you about it. <laughs> but I, I was going to ask, so with, 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 when you're talking about Mars caves, are you talking about, okay, we're going to send the astronauts to the cave to go in there and look around? Or is that a place to set up shop, like, like a, a home, ah. and then to look deeper uh, inside the cave for the life uh, uh, evidence and, and what, whatnot? Yeah, I think there's, there's still too much unknowns about caves, both on the moon and Mars, to really seriously plan around occupying them and settling them. I mean, it's a nice notion that is 
transposed from the earth that, you know, in a resource poor environment, that's what caveman and cave women did uh, in the early history of the earth. But caveman and cave women occupy caves in limestone mostly, not lava tubes. Very, very rare are the, there's, there's no example of a long-term permanent occupation of a lava tube on earth by humans, by early humans. And there's only evidence for transient occupation of lava tubes. And that's because lava tubes tend to be in volcanic regions that are very harsh to, to live in to begin with. Whereas caves in limestone are by definition carved out by water flowing. And so you're near a river, you're near water. So we, of course, have used caves as natural shelters uh, against the elements. Uh, but we've done so in very specific types of caves, which are mostly limestone caves or karst caves, uh, not lava tubes, which have been only, get, again, rarely occupied. On the moon and Mars, all we are dealing with, as far as we know, is lava tubes and those kinds of volcanic caves, uh, where, you know, unless the volcano is active and venting water, there's there's no uh, other source of water to, to, to be whole. So I'm... I understand this notion that you want to be sheltered from radiation, of course, micrometeoritic bombardment, stark day-night temperature changes, but you're better off doing that on Mars and on the moon by sandbagging your habitats. You you lay down habitats that are very well built, constrained with, you know where you're going to set them up. You, you understand that environment very well. It's a, it's a controlled setting uh, in that sense. And then sandbagging machines, they already exist. Robotic sandbagging machines, every time there's a flood somewhere, there's something that's scooping up sand in the front and pooping out a sandbag at the back. And it would take relatively little engineering, relatively, uh, to create a robotic sandbagger uh, on Mars or the moon. And now you are you just pile on your sandbags to, to shelter your habitats. That's a lot more control. So if you need to grow your base, you move the sandbags around, you know, presumably you have some forklift that will help you uh, do that or some robotic crane. Uh, but it's a lot more manageable than counting on, you know, integrating your, your habitat into a, a natural tunnel. Meanwhile, you want to explore those tunnels, those, those caves, but for, for their science and also for their resource potentially. Uh, the caves that I'm particularly interested in on, on Mars and on the moon are the ones that might have ice in them. Uh, and, you know, uh, the ones, the caves that we think might be present in the polar regions of the moon, for one thing, could be cold enough to have ice in them. Uh, and that, to me, is super exciting because now the ice might even be more readily accessible than in the polar regions themselves. I, I want to talk more about that, but just a, a, a quick comment here. You've been a bit of a contrarian in a couple of conversations we've had about uh, lunar lava tubes in particular. I think the the widely held perception a few years ago, in fact, there was a, the confirmation of a very large open area inside a lava tube on the moon from a from a Japanese orbiter, large enough to hold a small city, and the the, the space settlement community got very excited about this this idea of this enormous cavern down there, which which may end up being a good place, but as you pointed out in conversations in the past, this requires some investigation because we can see from looking at places like Hadley Rill that these may not be ideal, correct? That's exactly it. I mean, I'm definitely not ruling out us one day using caves and settling them. All I'm saying here is that it's very hard to make plans ahead of time like this, given our limited knowledge of what they are like underground, really, how stable the walls are, how you know they're prone to collapse. Uh, until we really know a lot more about these caves, you know, they are just going to remain scientific curiosities and potentially resource opportunities before they're really, really settlement, uh, you know, targets. But given the, the difference of the type of caves you see on the moon and Mars, if I remember correctly, the ones on Mars, at least that you can spot from orbit, tend to look more like lava pits and the one on the moon, ones on the moon tend to look more like lava tubes. Is that correct? Uh you actually see a wide range of types of cave entrances on the moon. Uh, you've got the lava tubes, but also things that are possibly best better described as crater pits or pit craters. Mm. You've, you've, we have these two types of cavities on in Hawaii, for example, quite widely represented. Mars has those both types as well, it seems, but also additional ones that are tectonic in origin, so due to associated with faulting as well. 
I, so there's there's really no single type of cave here on either of these worlds, but indeed on the moon, lava tubes are probably the most common, and the same thing is true on Mars. Can can I ask Pascal? Is there knowing what you've seen uh, of both like the conditions at Devon Island and then these these caves that you're looking at on uh, on the moon and and Mars? Is there one spot on the moon that right now you think is like, or in Mars, so so one for each, uh, that you would want to set up shop uh, if you could build a base there right now to, you know, that's within reach of those caves to go explore, but also has the the stuff that you would want to build those sandbags, to build that safe habitat for your crew? Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, I love this question. Uh, first of all, where do you build a base? Okay. And there's a... There's a lot of attraction and focus right now on being in the polar regions of the moon, especially the South Pole. But meanwhile, the South Pole is very, very difficult terrain compared to all these Apollo landings, which were done uh, either in the Lunar Mare, which are relatively flat, or in the Luna, at the boundary between the Mare and the Lunar Highlands, or in the case of Apollo 16, a very exceptionally flat Lunar Highland location. Uh, the Lunar... South Pole is very rugged, has lots of steep slopes, not to mention a very tricky uh, illumination situation that varies with time. And so if you go on a traverse somewhere, it's not just whether the terrain will allow you to get there, but will it remain lit for you to drive back? Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, do you have the autonomy to go through those dark shadowed areas and is it going to be safe enough for you to, to make your way? Anyway, uh, it's a very challenging terrain. And you know, if you look at how we normally do exploration, you set up your base usually in a place that is much safer and reliable to access at all times of the day, all times of the year. And then you equip yourself with a mobility system that allows you to access all these other places that you're excited to, to explore. So McMurdo, for example, in Antarctica, of course, was set up in a nice, you know, interesting place, but it's it's not, it's not the center of where the research in Antarctica is done. Uh, from McMurdo, you fan out with your mobility system, uh, C-130s for long range, twin otters for shorter range, uh, helicopters for even shorter range, and then sometimes you go with ground vehicles to these different locations. So you have your logistical hub in a relatively benign place, but then you, you have the mobility system that allows you to conquer, so to speak, uh, the rest of that continent. And that is actually the strength of the United States uh, uh, program in Antarctica. It's so much so that uh, this this whole strategy has strategic, uh, is strategically protected in Antarctica. The United States, for example, uh, sells C-130s to different countries, but doesn't let them equip their C-130s with skis to access Antarctica. Okay. <laughs> And so Chile and Argentina, all these countries who want to go to Antarctica with their American C-130s cannot put skis on them because uh, it's part of the deal. You don't, you don't put skis on these things. And so my point about this is that the mobility system is really what is giving you your strategic edge uh, to, to, to occupy, study, conquer this place, uh, conquer in a sort of a, to, to master it, if you will. Uh, and, uh, I think we should think of the moon in those terms. You know, we don't know really to what extent the South Polar regions are going to yield resources that are exploitable. We should, of course, explore them. We should send robotic missions and humans, uh, but into in forays to sites that are particularly interesting. But as far as setting up our base, I think we should be off the poles and in a place that's a lot more benign somewhere on the moon. I don't know, Clavius, uh, you know, just to to follow science fiction. Uh, the point is that it could be good almost anywhere else, but in the lunar polar highlands, north or south. Okay. Now, that's having said that, I would really push for the exploration of these candidate caves that we think we found. They're very difficult to ascertain from orbit uh, in the polar regions because now you're talking about caves that would be so cold that they could have ice in them ice accumulated over eons, just like uh, an impact crater that's permanently shadowed at the poles might have ice in it. Now you, you could have caves with ice in it. Now, if you have a sheltered environment with ice in it, now you're talking about a serious you know, wine cellar at the very least. <laughs> uh, but a joke aside, you, you, you now have an environment that's really exciting to explore and that will prepare you for Mars. 
which is really where we want to go. And of course, on Mars, you were bringing up, uh, you know, would you go in there with humans? Of course, you would send in robots first and then humans eventually if the cave is interesting. My favorite spot on Mars for a base, uh, we proposed it as part of NASA's uh, call for ideas and suggested landing sites. We proposed it in 2015. Uh, it's a place called Noctis Landing. Uh, it's site number 50 of the 50 or so sites that were proposed uh, to NASA that year. Uh, that's, I guess, just an arbitrary number. Uh, but that location, uh, I find, is very strategic scientifically uh, and responsive to our to our needs as a base because it's at the western end of Valles Marineris on Mars, this giant canyon system. Okay, Now, if you head towards the east, in other words, into the canyon, now you have access to this incredible record of rock layers that might allow you to search for fossil life and past examples of life. But most importantly, the site is still at low enough of an altitude that you can, from there, drive up to the volcanoes and access all these caves and lava tubes. Uh, so you're between both worlds. You, you can do extant life search towards the west, past life search towards the east, uh, and you're near the equator, which of course is more advantageous uh, thermally. You're in a canyon, pressure-wise, and you are um, uh, uh, you are in good comms for 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 talking back to the earth. And we now know that there's plenty of ice there in the ground. Uh, so, well, you know, all of that, all of that, it then taking in mind because we, I think when when people think about building a base or a place to live on Mars, they're, they're thinking of Elon Musk's vision of a city on Mars with, with the, the domes and, and, and all of that. Uh, how, how far are we from, from something like that now? I mean, it, clearly you have to homestead before you can, uh, I guess, metropolize, if that's a, a word <laughs> or, or not. Yeah. Um, but but, but, but how, how, how far away then do you think we, we are? Are we closer than ever before? Is it still you know, on the, on the fringes of science fiction? Uh, I, I admire what uh, Elon does, and I, I support his, uh, his uh, enabling us to access space more cheaply. But I'm not on board at all with this vision of uh, a huge chunk of human civilization somehow branching off onto Mars. I think that's, that's a real pipe dream. What you have to realize, of course, is that Mars is fundamentally a lethal... Uh, place. It's as lethal as the moon is, except that it's even farther uh, from the Earth. And with the toxicity of the regolith, it's even more lethal than the moon. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, I don't see the point in having a large piece of humanity who, with technology, would create some sort of a an ICU unit, because that's what a life support system is. It's an intensive care unit to put a bunch of people in an intensive care unit on Mars. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, I do see what I do see a future on Mars that would involve uh, research stations, one big base or maybe several others. It's the Antarctic model, which has, by the way, lasted for a long time uh, and continues, and a healthy dose of tourism. So I do see on Mars uh, the opportunity one day, you know, uh, maybe uh, some distance, short distance away from a base, sharing the same. Uh, airport, so to speak, a bit of, of a uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth situation uh, where you have a, a base in the middle and then, you know, Dallas would be your, your research base, but then Fort Worth, of course, not at all at those scales of cities. That's precisely, that's my whole point. It's a small research base, and but on the other side of the airport, a, a resort, some sort of a, an Epcot where people who travel from the earth maybe by the tens at a time or, you know, the way Elon sees it, once they get there, they will live in a uh, domed environment for a few weeks, uh, you know, have fun with the Martian gravity, uh, swim in that, go out for some token EVAs, take a train ride to the edge of the canyon, but then you're done. Uh, th there's no point in raising children on Mars or, you know, or... Uh, you know, so so people who would live on Mars for the long term might be your your park ranger type person, you know, with his or her family, and then of course there would be a rotation of these anyway, and then 
Uh, same with the scientific crew that occupies the station. But this is very much the model of Antarctica, and it has it has worked well for an environment that fundamentally is hostile and, and not really conducive to human occupation. Uh, in the 60s, the Chilean and the Argentinians in Antarctica had tried to settle families there. They had built apartment complexes, moved families with some you know, financial incentives. It completely failed, uh, you know, they they eventually repatriated everybody back, and these buildings are now sitting and and sort of uh, in a decrepit state in Antarctica uh, and unoccupied because it's just not a tenable thing, you know, for financially or even in any possible way, it's not tenable to have this, this large chunk of population living in a place that's so expensive and and dicey to live in. Uh, now, you know, this notion that technology can conquer everything, I, I think that it can be applied much more productively to, to improving places on Earth where we can live and sustain more people. You know, bear in mind the other thing is that there's no running water on Mars, okay? So, you know, just sewage and all these things that we, we, uh, we flush around all day long uh, would have to be somehow processed. I mean, if we're very long ways away and... Um, uh, and again, I think the case of it being desirable has, has yet to be made. Now, cities in space, giant O'Neillian wheels, I'm on board. That's actually Jeff Bezos' vision. Yeah. Uh, I'm on board because now you're talking about a station that can be much closer to the Earth. It's a completely controlled environment. You don't have the, the vagaries of the Martian surface, and you don't have the environmental impact either of the Martian surface. You can You can do things in a lot more control way in a station. And I, I do see a multiplication of, of big stations for, for humans to go visit in the future. And as far as the moon is concerned, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, research bases, uh, maybe at some point a, a, a tourism-focused uh, facility, a bit like in Andy Weir's book, uh, Artemis, yeah. you know, where you can take a train ride to the Apollo 11 site uh, and a few things like this. Uh, my hope is that by the time we would really be in a position to somehow send, you know, hundreds or thousands of people to Mars, we will by then have found exoplanets that are nearby with, with you know, existing habitable atmospheres, an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Does Proxima Centauri Bravo, which is in the habitable zone and is about one one point seventeen Earth mass masses, uh, is that thing habitable? Does it have oxygen in its atmosphere? So James Webb Telescope will tell us. Uh, but until we, uh, you know, so I, I think that it's it's less, it's more credible actually for us to envision sending an arc of people, uh, you know, maybe a generational ship to to one of these planets and then occupy them than, than terraforming Mars or, or living on Mars as it is. Well, anyway, I've heard I, that- I've said my part. Mar- Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. Somebody had to say it, but uh, yeah. it you know there's a there's a further interesting conversation to be had about why or why not to settle or to use outdated terminology colonize these places. And and Pascal, you and I have talked about this a lot about the sort of idea of sorties or expeditionary kind of movements. And um, I do want to have you back to discuss this more, including what this might cost in a world with or without yeah. Starship. But uh, before we run out of time, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your artwork. Oh, oh, I just there is one more point. It occurred to me this morning, I was out taking my morning walk and I was listening to The Economist radio about Musk and Twitter, which, of course, has been talked about on the Twit Network quite a bit. You know, we could probably be building condos on Europa for $44 billion. So I know it isn't an all cash transaction, but for the amount of money that went into this compared to what he spent on Starship, which is still significant and a tremendous achievement, uh, Musk could have could have had not just his own partial program, but he basically could have just bought NASA and taken the whole thing over. But, but I digress. Um, Pascal, you're an accomplished painter. I love your work. One of these days I'm going to buy some of it. And I just want you to talk a little bit about uh, your inspiration, you know, did that date in some way back to Chesley Bonestell, who's a, a brilliant space artist from the early to mid 20th century? And what drives you? Because your work is really uh, quite wonderful and significant. 
You know, I, I've been drawing since I was a kid. My father was an architect and really good at sketching, so I, I watched him a lot. Um, uh, there, there was a phase in my life when I was in my, uh, you know, from zero to 20 where I painted and drew, drew uh, quite a bit. And then once I hit 20, I was so focused on becoming a scientist and, and wanting to, you know, being, trying to be good at it, that from roughly 20 to 40, uh, I didn't paint. I didn't do any I mis- much artwork. Uh, but then by the time I hit 40, I, I, I I started becoming frustrated that things in space weren't quite moving at the pace that I wanted. So I tried to, I started to depict what I, what I thought the, uh, you know, the future should look like or, or will look like. And so you will find that in my paintings, I, uh, I am, I'm sort of trying to, to really draw what, uh, what I think our future in space might, might, might be like. So I don't know if you can see there, but right here on the left, I have, uh, a, uh, a rocket ship that's powered by nuclear thermal uh, propulsion uh, that's in orbit around Mars and off of Phobos with, uh, you can't see that, but the three little guys that are on EVA, maybe you can, I can bring that up close. So this is the mission that should have happened. <laughs> well, this is, I think, what we should really be focusing on. And if NASA has a has room for the next step, we should really be pushing nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, and uh, I mean, there was an existing program, as you probably know, the, the NERVA mm-hmm. program, which was canceled in, you know, by the Nixon administration, uh, but they were almost ready for flight. They had made yeah. lots of uh, successful tests in the deserts of Nevada. Uh, and, uh, and I think that program, uh, is either already being revived or revisited, but should be aggressively it pursued. Is. Because that's right. It's uh, I don't know to what extent it's known, but uh, it should be aggressively pursued uh, for civilian space travel, uh, and it will open the gates to Mars and uh, Titan. Incidentally, is another place. So I really hope nobody gets this wrong. I'm totally in favor of humans going into space. I just don't don't see big cities on Mars or, or the Moon as being a, a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, we could go to Titan. If we had nuclear propulsion, uh, a journey to Titan with a nuclear thermal rocket could be could happen in a couple of years. In other words, about two years to get there. Uh, and and now Titan is an entirely different world. Titan is actually more friendly than Mars or the Moon. Uh, the gravity on Titan is even less than on the Moon. It's fourteen uh, percent of Earth's gravity instead of seventeen percent, which is what the Moon is. Uh, but Titan has an atmosphere with a surface pressure of about 1.4 bars. So it has a thicker atmosphere than even the Earth. It's easier to fly on Titan, both because gravity is lower and uh, uh, the atmosphere is denser. Uh, and so you that's why Dragonfly actually, of course, is, is, is you know happening. It's an incredible mission that I'm 100% behind. Uh, although, I mean, I have, just as a supporter, I have nothing to do with it. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, Titan is a place that you could explore without a pressurized spacesuit. All you would need is, in fact, we're working on a paper that describes this a little bit. Uh, all you would need essentially is a, is a well-insulated level A chemical suit. Uh, you know, level A chemical suits, which are made by DuPont and a few other companies, uh, are suits that uh, completely seal you from the, chemically from the environment around you but are uh, not pressurized per se. So you are donning, first of all, a full head, full face oxygen mask with a couple of oxygen tanks in your back. And then you don this suit that you zip up and Velcro and seal uh, to keep all the gases out of uh, contact with your, your body and your lungs. Uh, but that's good enough. And of course, on Titan, you want to protect yourself from the cold. Temperatures are of order minus 300 Fahrenheit, so minus 200 Celsius. Uh, uh, so, but protecting yourself from the cold, we can do that. You know, we can do. Well, I've experienced remember, minus 200 m- minus 200 C uh, with wind chill oof. Uh, in Antarctica. If I remember correctly, uh, if I'm swimming on Titan, for those of us who are a little above our ideal body weight, I'll be a little more buoyant in the ethane oceans there, right? Floating in hydrocarbons. You could seas. be more buoyant, yeah. 
Uh, now, you know, we, we still have to answer why would humans want to be on Titan? Well, you know, that's going to depend on, uh, in part on what Dragonfly discovers, but it's a very exciting world that has indeed water, I mean, not water, but uh, fluids to, to contend with and, and uh, possibly lots of interesting prebiotic chemistry going on. Uh, my point is that it would be an incredible frontier to explore that we could. And the radiation environment around Saturn is a lot more benign than around Jupiter. So, so the surface of Titan, plus it has this thick atmosphere. So you're probably Welsh protected from radiation. You're going to be okay. The surface of Titan, aside from the fact that you are really far from the Earth, is safer than the surface of the Moon or, or Mars for humans. You spring a leak in your spacesuit, you're not automatically dead. Well, I just want to point out my ideal candidacy for being the first astronaut to go to Titan because I grew up in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s where the air was very similar to white Titan looks like all the, the time. organic haze. Yeah. So, we, you know, living two miles from the mountains that I couldn't see, and I'm not exaggerating, was extraordinary. Um, where can we go to find more about not just your uh, – your work with the Houghton Mars program, but also with uh, projects, sorry, but also your paintings. So give us a couple of websites. Uh, Houghton like. Mars Project, uh, the best source uh, is probably the Mars Institute's website. And we have a Houghton Mars Project uh, series of pages there. So that's marsinstitute.no uh, or just uh, marsonearth.org. That will get you there to marsonearth.org. And and by the way, uh, speaking of Mars on Earth, sorry to interrupt, but I just saw for the first time, I believe that was the title of the video on YouTube. I don't know how I hadn't caught it before. So I had seen your longer film uh, about the traverse of the, of the vehicle you had, but your Mars on Earth film on YouTube is just spectacular, really something. The one with the astronaut smart glove? Uh, this was the one taken on the Pixel 3. It was more of kind of a general introduction oh. to uh, Devon. Oh, Island. that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah so Google really came beautiful. up with us uh, a couple of years ago. That's right. That's called Mars on Earth, A Visit to Devon Island. Yeah. yeah. So that was filmed on a Pixel 3. Uh, it's an introduction to just life at our base camp. And it's it's recent enough that it's current, essentially. Uh, the other video I would recommend people to watch for Devon Island is Mars on Earth, uh, the astronaut smart glove. Astronaut smart glove. Uh, we're very proud of that one because uh, it's it's really a promising technology for for you know future EVAs that you're going to see there. And then, uh, as far as my paintings are concerned, you could go to pascallee.net and go from there to visit. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank, well, thank you for the shout out on that. Yeah, now that we're sending millions of listeners to your site, I better uh, scoop up the ones I want before they get there and start bidding the prices up. Uh, Tariq, before we wrap up, where can we go to learn more about what you're up to and what's happening at space.com? And I just kind of gave it away, didn't I? Yeah, well, I would I, I, I would just point out that uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the future on Mars looks bright. I think Pascal seems to, 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 to agree, but we clearly have a lots of, lots of challenges. Um, I am very much looking forward to, uh, more immediately the solar eclipse of April 30th that folks should, should look at and, uh, they can find me and that at space.com this weekend and, uh, uh at uh, space.com or, uh, I'm on Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. And that is a partial everywhere, right? This time it's partial a partial eclipse. solar eclipse, but you have to be in South America. So I will be watching it online. Oh, very good. That That's the safest place because I don't need my Eclipse glasses. Well, I, I want to thank you for joining us, uh, Pascal. Let's remind everybody you. you're a planetary scientist and director of the Mars Institute, polar thank adventurer, you. painter, and did I forget? Oh, yes, brain surgeon. And we'll be back <laughs> next week with that's our brother, list. That's not the, me. <laughs> what's that? That's my younger brother. It's not me, the brain surgeon. Oh, okay. Well, I so I guess you guys split the buckaroo bonsai. Uh, listing. Uh, we'll be back next week with our list of the very best and very worst space movies of all time. If you want to suggest your own best and worst films or make any other suggestions, so long as they're generally civil, please feel free to email us at twis at twit.tv. That's twis at twit.tv. Uh, new episodes and more bad jokes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe and please tell your friends if you enjoy the show and if you don't enjoy the show tell your friends anyway 
And you can head to our website anytime at twit.tv slash TWIS. See you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. <laughs>